few weeks ago, in the parking lot of a church I attend, I saw a bumper sticker. It said, angry? Question mark. Need a weapon? Question mark. Pray the rosary. On a very superficial reading, some might interpret this as dangerous language, as fomenting violence. But look more carefully at the logic and the straightforward meaning of the words. It's offering an alternative to violence. Or you might say, as the church has, the rosary is a spiritual weapon, meaning not a physical one, a weapon used in spiritual warfare. As such, it's one of the most popular items in the church's arsenal, and as you might expect, has a long history. God bless America. God love you. I want these to be my first words of greeting to you. They will be the concluding words on each broadcast. I am not the Catholic candidate for president. I am the Democratic Party's candidate for president. You've embarked on a Catholic history trek. If you want to say a set number of prayers, it's important to count them. If you want to offer up to 10 prayers, you can use your fingers easily enough, but if you want to get to a number past 10, like 150, some sort of aid is necessary to help you keep track. Adherents of various religions throughout the ages have utilized tools, such as strings of beads, to aid in counting their prayers. This tradition of counting prayers is also found in Christianity, dating back to the earliest days of the church, especially among the monks and ascetics. And a couple examples include St. Paul the Hermit, mentioned in episode 50, covering Marian titles, who would daily collect 300 pebbles and throw one away, as he said one of the 300 prayers he repeated each day. And in the Greek church, a cord with knots was used to pray the sign of the cross 100 times, with genuflections for each. As Kevin and I covered in our History of the Liturgy of the Hours, the early monks developed the tradition of praying the psalms. In the division, for which of the 150 psalms they would pray at different hours of the day, led to these liturgical or canonical hours of prayer, and later the breviary. But not every member of the monastic communities could read or memorize all 150 psalms, especially illiterate lay brothers. They would offer other prayers in place of the psalms, usually the Pater Noster, Latin for Our Father. We see this practice in the ancient customs of Cluny, the Benedictine monastery covered in our episode on the Cistercians. Every priest would offer mass for the death of a member, while the brothers would say either 50 psalms or recite 50 Our Fathers. And the Knights Templar, who modeled the rule after the Cistercians, would recite the Lord's Prayer a similar number of times when they were unable to attend the monastic choir for reciting the psalms. By the 11th and 12th centuries in Europe, the monastic practice of reciting a set number of prayers was adopted by the laity, who often recited a series of these paternosters. Tools were employed to count these prayers. Some peculiar ones included pebbles, berries, or discs of bone threaded on a string. But the most prevalent counting tool were strings of beads or strings of knots. These prayer strings, which contained 50, 100, or 150 beads, were called paternosters and they became so prevalent, the one who created a paternoster was called a paternoster-er, and craft guilds were established, a paternoster-ers, in places like Paris and London, and in the UK, one can still find paternoster Row, where such a guild had set up shop to create and sell these paternosters. As mentioned in our Catholic history trek on the history of the Hail Mary, episode 53, the popularity of the Hail Mary began to increase around this time, and it wasn't long before the faithful began to pray the Ave Maria on these paternoster beads. Although, in those days, the Hail Mary was a much shorter prayer than the one we know today. It was more of a salutation, as it contained the first two scriptural parts, the angelic salutation, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, and St. Elizabeth's proclamation, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. It would be a couple more centuries before the second half of the prayer was added. By the 12th century, the basic form of the rosary, with 150 Hail Marys, 
preyed on a string of paternoster beads was in place. A century later, St. Thomas Aquinas would refer to this as the Psalter of the Blessed Virgin. But the Psalter of Our Lady was just one of many devotions, and its popularity was not yet widespread. But that was before heretics and a great saint entered the picture. The context for the popularization of the rosary as we know it was the spiritual condition of southern France in the medieval period. A heresy, or some have argued a non-Christian religion, known as Albigensianism appeared in the 11th century. Its theology was similar to that of the ancient history of Manichaeanism. The world is sharply divided between the principles of good and evil which are balanced against each other. The spiritual dimension is good, the material dimension is evil. This contradicts the orthodox Christian view of the essential goodness of creation generated by an all-good and all-powerful God. This also led to a host of erroneous, even dangerous, practical ideas, including encouragement of suicide to free the pure spirit from the sinful body. I mention this to highlight the fact that Albigensianism was not merely a strange private idiosyncrasy, but was manifested as a danger to public order. This is why political and military action could be justified against it, which is not to defend all such actions. Various local French councils condemned Albigensianism, or Catharism, over the course of about 200 years, but it continued to spread. Under Pope Innocent III, elected in 1198, the Church's campaign against the Albigensians intensified. Spurred by a threat from Innocent, the Count of Toulouse promised to crack down on the Cathars within his realm, which was the hotbed of the heresy. More important was the encounter of a Spanish priest traveling through southern France in 1203, who was dismayed at the damage to the Church and society that Albigensianism had effected. His name was Domingo Guzman known to history as St. Dominic. Dominic had been born in the kingdom of Castile in about 1170 into a saintly family. His mother was beatified as Blessed Joanna of Aza, and one of his brothers was also blessed, Manes de Guzman. Dominic was devout from a young age, and he dedicated his life to the church. To that end, he studied at the University of Palencia. The Bishop of Osma recruited him to be a canon of his cathedral. He was serving in that capacity when the bishop chose him to accompany him on a delegation to England on behalf of the king of Castile. They passed through southern France on their way, with the result that Dominic was convicted of the need to counter Albigensian errors. The pair ended up in Rome, where Innocent III ordered them to assist the Cistercians, who had been deputed to deal with Albigensianism. For more about the Cistercians, see our podcast number 67. The Cistercians had to that point made little headway, in part because their opponents exhibited a more inspiring way of life than did the monks. The Cistercians lived in comfort, even splendor, against which the asceticism of the materialism-hating Cathars shone the more brilliantly to the masses of French peasants. So Dominic engaged on two fronts. First, he persuaded his Cistercian allies to return to a more properly monastic way of life. Secondly, he used his considerable intellectual ability to debate the Albigensians on theological matters. On both fronts, the Catholics had success. To reinforce his efforts, Dominic founded communities of both men and women, the Order of Preachers, or Dominicans. During this time, the Catholic battle with Albigensianism unfortunately turned violent. Following the assassination of one of the Cistercians, Simon de Montfort, a northern French knight, led a bloody reprisal against Albigensian communities. Dominic was in the midst of this violence, but in the words of the old Catholic Encyclopedia article, always on the side of mercy, wielding the arms of the spirit, while others wrought death and desolation with the sword. This crusade was the context for the connection between St. Dominic and the development of the rosary. As the traditional story relates, for a while St. Dominic labored against the Albigensian heretics with little discernible success. So, in 1208, he withdrew to a monastery in Toulouse to pray and do penance. It was there that the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to him and instructed him to use the rosary to reform the world. It was recorded that she claimed, In this warfare the battering ram has always been the angelic psalter, which is the foundation of the New Testament. Therefore, if you wish to reach these hardened souls and win them over to God, preach my psalter. The psalter she spoke of was the 150 Hail Marys of the rosary. After this vision, St. Dominic would spend the remainder of his life preaching the Rosary. He founded the Confraternity of the Rosary and taught the 15 promises of the Holy Rosary, which include, those who are devoted to praying it will not perish and will receive spiritual protection at the hour of death. 
Following the vision and the spread of the rosary, the crusade against the Albigensian heresy was ultimately successful, a victory which some credit to the rosary. Despite the apparent success and popularity of the rosary, it fell out of use in the two centuries following the death of St. Dominic. There are reasons which can explain this, which come from both outside of the church and from within. In the mid-14th century, the Black Death wiped out roughly one-third of Europe's population. At the end of the century, the Great Western Schism erupted, bringing with it 40 years of anti-popes as multiple claimants vied for the papacy. And between these two events, the flagellant movement turned into a heretical sect, bringing even more disorder in Europe. Flagellants were those who practiced a severe form of self-mortification where they would whip themselves on the back with a flagrum or a whip, similar to the scourging Jesus received at the hands of the Romans before he was crucified. This self-flagellation itself wasn't the heresy, as it's long been an ascetical practice of mortifying the body and should perhaps become a future episode of Catholic History Trek. And you can find this practice referenced in the lives of many saints who would take the scourge or speak of their discipline. In post-Black Death Europe, this movement devolved into a heretical sect with its own set of doctrines, and the heresy associated with flagellation was ultimately suppressed. After these two centuries of plague, heresy, and schism, the restoration of the rosary came about by another Dominican, Blessed Alanus de Rupe, or as he's often called, Alan de la Roche. Born 200 years after St. Dominic, Alan became a master of sacred theology and famed Dominican preacher in France. As the story goes, while saying Mass one day in 1460, Jesus spoke to him from the Eucharistic host and reproached him for not preaching the rosary of his mother. In subsequent visions, Alan was instructed on the history and use of the rosary, the 15 promises of the rosary, and was given the information which became the source of the tradition of St. Dominic and the rosary. In response to these purported visions, Alan unceasingly preached the rosary for the final decade and a half of his life and reestablished the confraternity of the rosary. His preaching was met with much success and by his death in 1475, the rosary was becoming the popular Catholic devotion it remains today. This is the history of St. Dominic and the rosary, which many have some familiarity with, but then the Jesuits got involved. In the early 17th century, Herbert Rosswide, a Jesuit priest, spent his spare time, vacations, and retreats exploring the libraries and many monasteries so he could copy, by hand, the many documents he found related to church history and hagiography, the lives of the saints. He devoted all his free time to this labor of love and created a short work of what he compiled with plans to publish something much more extensive. Apparently, Upon hearing of Father Rosswhite's plans, Cardinal Bellarmine exclaimed, This man counts, then, on living 200 years longer. Rosswhite had collected quite an extensive collection of manuscripts and notes, but his plans exceeded his life, and by his death in 1629, not a single page was ready for the printer. The superior of the Belgian province of the Society of Jesus sent Father John Van Boland to examine the collection left behind after Rosswhite's death and advise the superior what to do with it. Boland realized the historical treasure which had been compiled and received permission to complete and expand the work which had been started. Father Boland soon realized that he, like his predecessor, had bitten off more than he could chew. So he requested an assistant and eventually a group of Jesuits endeavored in this work under the name of the Bolandist Society. Beginning with Father Rosswhite's collection, these Belgian Jesuits composed the Octus Sanctorum, or Lives of the Saints, for the saints listed on the liturgical calendar. These Bolandists worked tirelessly to separate fact from fiction in the lives of the saints. When they got to St. Dominic, their extensive research called into question the amazing connection believed to exist between the saint and the rosary. The practice of praying Our Lady's Psalter of 150 Hail Marys using a string of beads was already in place before the birth of St. Dominic. So the story of the Blessed Virgin Mary presenting the rosary to Dominic, who then introduced it to the world, seemed dubious at best, although it could have been that St. Dominic modified the already existing string of beads or possibly promoted and spread the use of the rosary upon Mary's request. But even this theory 
was met with uncertainty, the Bolandists discovered that none of the early biographies of St. Dominic made even the faintest reference to the rosary. If he had been its great advocate, these works all failed to capture the significance. Not only were the earliest biographies of his life silent on the rosary, but so were the works of art. He was canonized rather quickly, only about a dozen years after he passed from this life. So paintings and sculptures began to pop up soon after his death, when his contemporaries were still living. So if there was a significant connection between St. Dominic and the rosary, one would expect a depiction of the saint with the rosary. Yet for the next two and a half centuries, the art was as silent as the biographies. The Bolandists also poured through the early Dominican provincial constitutions and thousands of manuscripts of devotional treatises, sermons, and chronicles written between 1220 and 1450. And in all of this, they found zero references to the rosary. They discovered that documentation of the story of St. Dominic's vision of Mary and the connection with the rosary didn't emerge until Alain de la Roche made these claims some 250 years after the earthly life of St. Dominic. Put that into a modern context, it would be as if Kevin or I made a significant claim about the life of George Washington, which had never been recorded in any of the biographies and never depicted in any of the paintings or statues of the U.S. president. Based on this, the Bolandists concluded there was insufficient evidence to support the tradition of St. Dominic and the Rosary. With this lack of evidence, one can either take the negative view or positive view of the saint and the rosary. The negative view would be that the traditional count of St. Dominic and the rosary did not happen, and the use of the rosary did not fall out of use after his death because he didn't promote it. And when Alan promoted the rosary 250 years later, he made the whole thing up about St. Dominic, either mistakenly or deliberate. Conversely, the positive view would be that the traditional count of St. Dominic and the rosary really did happen, the use of the rosary really did fall out of use after Dominic's death, and the historical records either didn't record the connection, or they did record it, but were lost to history. And Blessed Alan really did receive a mystical vision reestablishing this history between St. Dominic and the rosary, which had been lost. So, which is it? While there's no evidence supporting the positive view, there's also no evidence supporting the negative view. Many theologians and church leaders, including the Dominican Archbishop John McNicholas, have taken the negative view that the accounts of Alan de la Roche are not to be treated as historical. But many others, including the popes, have accepted the positive view regarding Dominic and the Rosary. In the mid 18th century, the eminent scholar and historian, Prospero Lambertini, who later became Pope Benedict XIV, was asked about the connection between St. Dominic and the Rosary. Given the doubts presented by the lack of evidence in the 250 years following St. Dominic's earthly life, Lambertini suggested who could argue against such a long list of learned and holy popes who unanimously attributed the institution of the Rosary to St. Dominic. Another factor in favor of the positive view is the fact that between the death of St. Dominic and the extensive work of the Bolandist, chaos swept over Europe, which could explain the lack of evidence. Besides the aforementioned Black Death and Western Schism, there was also the emergence of the Protestant movement, which resulted in the destruction of many Catholic convents and monasteries. Documents verifying the traditional account could have been among the historical treasures destroyed by the Protestant revolutionaries. And then there's also the Militia of Jesus Christ, which was founded in the early 13th century by a group of Dominicans. This group daily prayed Our Lady's Psalter of 150 Hail Marys, and while the militia's exact founding is up for debate, some posit that St. Dominic was the founder of this group, or at the very least, was acquainted with its founders. St. Dominic's exact connection with the rosary is something for speculation, but the history of the naming of the rosary is a little less speculative. The term rosary, rosarius in Latin, means a garland or bouquet of roses. The term has been used historically in a figurative way to mean a collection of various kinds of things. So it could simply mean a collection of prayers, like 50 Hail Marys, or 150, or 200, as you prefer. More literally, there is a legend dating to the medieval period of a vision of Mary making a garland out of rosebuds that she received from a young monk, who formed one every time he prayed a Hail Mary. 
In one of our Titles of Mary episodes, I noted how the rose has long been associated with Mary. St. Gregory of Nazianzus in the 4th century spoke of prayers as weaving a chaplet for Mary. Chaplet meaning wreath or corona, a relative of our English word crown. With the association of roses with Ave Marias as already mentioned, the image of a wreath or crown of roses comes into usage in the medieval period, and Rosarius is the term favored by St. Dominic, although the later promoter, Alain de la Roche, objected to the term as too much associated with pagan Rome, where the rose was connected to Aphrodite and illicit love. If Alan had had his way, we'd all be calling our bead prayer the Psalter of the Virgin, maybe POV for short. Although both terms can be found in use during the 1400s, Allen's was a losing battle and Rosarium won out in the end. Probably most listeners are familiar with the structure of the rosary, but I'll say a few words about it, noting that you can learn more about the history of each of these prayers by consulting Scott's wonderful series on Catholic prayers. As of 2022, here's what the standard rosary looks like. It begins with a crucifix on which is prayed the Apostles' Creed then a large bead on which is prayed the Our Father, followed by three small beads on which are prayed Hail Marys. The next large bead signals the praying of a Glory Be, the Gloria Patri that Scott and I traditionally end our episodes with. From there on, it's a series of five decades, consisting of an Our Father, ten Hail Marys, and a Glory Be. It's become almost universal to end the rosary with the Hail Holy Queen prayer, or the Salve Regina. Scott's got an episode on that, number 68. Another very common addition is the Fatima prayer, O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins. This occurs at the end of each decade, a request made by Our Lady during her apparitions to three children at Fatima, Portugal in 1917. Depending on a huge variety of other factors, geographical location, ethnicity, parish or family tradition, association with a religious order or community, the rosary as said at any given time or place may be accompanied by any number of other prayers and devotions as well. There are also many variations of the rosary itself, besides the standard or most common form I've just described. The Carthusian rosary is sometimes seen as a forerunner of the Dominican one. Its structure was not entirely stable, but consisted of meditations on 50 incidents or themes from Jesus' life, during which Hail Marys were said. The standard rosary being associated so closely with the Dominicans, naturally the Franciscans would have their own distinctive version the seven-decked Franciscan crown, or seraphic rosary. Scott mentioned that in our episode on Franciscans, number 38. The Servite rosary consists of seven sets of seven beads and focuses on the seven sorrows of Mary. The Servite rosary, named for the 13th century Order of the Servants of Mary, is also sometimes called the Servite chaplet, which highlights the etymological brotherhood of these two terms, and in a way, any chaplet, could also be called a rosary. These individual prayers recited on each bead of the rosary form the structure, but the meditations on the mysteries of the rosary are the heart of the prayer. If the mystical visions of Blessed Alan are to be believed, are later revealed to him, when people say 150 angelic salutations, this prayer is very helpful to them and is very pleasing tribute to me. But they will do better still and will please me even more if they say these salutations while meditating on the life, death, and passion of Jesus Christ, for this meditation is the soul of the prayer. When the Psalter of Our Lady was first developed with the 150 Aves, there were no meditations, but these were later additions, usually considered to have originated in the 15th century. The exact history of the mysteries of the Rosary are themselves a mystery but historians popularly associate four names with the origin of the mysteries with varying contributions associated with each. Henry of Calcar, Dominic of Prussia, Alain de la Roche, and Jacob Sprenger. The oldest of the four, Henry of Calcar, was a Cistercian prior and visitator. He's generally credited with dividing the 150 Hail Marys into 15 decades of 10 Hail Marys each, with an Our Father between each decade, Henry is sometimes associated with first introducing the mysteries, but that accomplishment often goes to another Cistercian, Dominic of Prussia. Dominic of Prussia is not to be confused with St. Dominic, who Kevin told us about. St. Dominic was born over 200 years earlier. Dominic of Prussia lived a wayward life until he reformed his ways in his mid-twenties. He joined the Cistercians and engaged in a life of severe penance and religious fervor. He also had many visions ascribed to him. Possibly inspired by one of these visions, 
He's often credited as adding a meditation to the end of each of the Hail Marys of the Rosary. He introduced 50 meditations which cover the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Throughout the course of praying the 150 Hail Marys of Our Lady Psalter, each meditation would be repeated three times. As I mentioned previously, in the 14th century, the Hail Mary was shorter than it is today. So the first couple Hail Marys with the meditations from St. Dominic of Prussia would be as follows. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Jesus, conceived of the Holy Spirit during the Annunciation of the Angel. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Jesus, who together with you, who has conceived him, visits St. Elizabeth. This would continue on to the 50th mystery, which was, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Jesus, who reigns together with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and with you, most holy mother, triumphant and glorious forever. As a personal side, after doing the research for this episode, I've tried praying the rosary with the mystery added after each of the older, shorter Hail Marys. I've done this a couple times, and I found I like it. It makes it easier for me to meditate on the mysteries because I'm repeating a mystery much more frequently. And I get to go through the entire life, death, and resurrection of Jesus through the course of just 50 Hail Marys. It's also been suggested that Alan de la Roche introduced these mysteries added to the end of each Hail Mary of Our Lady's Psalter, and that these mysteries came to Alan in a mystical vision. But it's more likely that Alan, who is 50 years younger than Dominic, popularized Dominic's mysteries. Jacob Sprenger, another Dominican, is best known to history as the co-author of Hammer of Witches, written by Heinrich Kramer. The book from 1487 is a treatise on witches and witchcraft, and was apparently used by inquisitors to identify the heresy of witchcraft. Sprenger has also been linked to the grouping of the mysteries of the rosary. Some have credited him with reducing the number of mysteries from 50 to 15, one for each decade, and for grouping these 15 mysteries into three sets of joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries. Today, we know these arrangements as the joyful mysteries of the Annunciation, Visitation, Birth of Jesus, Presentation, and Finding the Child in the Temple, the sorrowful mysteries, the agony in the garden, the scourging of the pillar, the crowning of thorns, carrying the cross, and the crucifixion, and the glorious mysteries as the resurrection, the ascension, the descent of the Holy Spirit, the assumption of Mary, and the coronation of Mary as Queen of Heaven and Earth. A century later, Pope St. Pius V issued a papal bull, Consuverant Romani Pontificis, which provides us details on the composition of the rosary in the mid-16th century. He calls the rosary the Psalter of the Blessed Virgin Mary because she is venerated by the angelic greeting 150 times, according to the number of psalms. He mentions the decades of ten Hail Marys each and the Lord's Prayer, prayed between each decade, and Pope Pius V also explains there are meditations interposed with the prayers, which show forth the entire life of our Lord Jesus Christ. In subsequent years, it became the common practice, as is done today, that instead of praying the entire rosary of 150 Hail Marys, Catholics would only pray one-third of the Psalter of Our Lady, so 50 Hail Marys. This is where the three groupings of joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries attributed to Jacob Sprenger became very useful. The faithful could meditate on one-third of the mysteries when they prayed one-third of the rosary. And with this tradition of praying one-third of the rosary, certain mysteries became recommended for certain days. The cycle of joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries would be prayed Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then repeated Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. With Sunday left open for any of the three sets of mysteries, depending on the liturgical season. But this cycle was thrown into disarray in 2002. That was the year Pope John Paul II introduced the Luminous Mysteries in his apostolic letter, Rosarium Virginis Mariae. These mysteries of light cover the period between the joyful and sorrowful mysteries. They include the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan, the wedding at Cana, the proclamation of the kingdom the transfiguration of Jesus, and the institution of the Eucharist. Centuries earlier, when the number of mysteries meditated upon during the Rosary had been condensed from 50, said after each Hail Mary, to 15, one for each decade, only 15 mysteries were retained, while 35 were set aside. With the introduction of the Luminous Mysteries, a handful of these 35 mysteries were restored. 
But when Pope John Paul II introduced the Luminous Mysteries, they were not enthusiastically received by everybody. Some people didn't like the flow of the mysteries, some people didn't like the mysteries he selected, and some people didn't like meddling with the tradition that went back over 500 years. But perhaps the most significant objection was the introduction of the new mysteries extinguish the rosary as Our Lady's Psalter. Consider when the monks prayed the Psalms, they prayed 150 of them. When Paternosters replaced the Psalms, the number of Paternosters prayed was 150. And later, when Ave Marias replaced the Paternosters, it was 150 Hail Marys. When Dominica Prussia proposed 50 mysteries, they could be applied to the 150 Hail Marys of the Psalter. And when Jacob Springer reduced the number of mysteries, he reduced it to 15. So it would still be one mystery for each of the 15 decades of the Psalter. The Rosary has always consisted of 150 Hail Marys. That's why the Blessed Virgin called the Rosary her Psalter. And so the number of mysteries have always corresponded with this number. But when Pope John Paul II added five more mysteries in the Rosary, he increased the number to 20. And there just isn't a good way to divide 150 Hail Marys by 20 mysteries, unless one is going to meditate on a mystery every seven and a half Hail Marys. Not very practical. Because of this, there are some Catholics who don't use the Luminous Mysteries. By not using them, it allows them to retain the Rosary as Our Lady's Psalter by using the number of mysteries, which corresponds with 150 Hail Marys. But most Catholics do use the Luminous Mysteries. Today, the 50 Hail Marys, which constitutes one third of the Rosary, are often treated as the full Rosary, so the need to keep the number of mysteries consistent with the number of 150 Psalms is essentially irrelevant for most people who pray the Rosary. Regardless if one uses the Luminous Mysteries or does not use them, the important thing seems to be on the meditation of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus when praying the Rosary. As a spiritual weapon in use for centuries, the Rosary has been used to pray for a virtually infinite number of intentions, but prominent among them is peace in the world. At the same time, it's also been turned to as a prayer for protection during time of war, or sometimes for victory in war. The most famous instance of the last is surely the Battle of Lepanto, the 1571 naval engagement between the forces of Catholic Europe and those of the Ottoman Empire. Since the rise of Islam in the 7th century, the borderland between Christian Europe and Islamic North Africa and Asia had been the site of innumerable conflicts, among them the Crusades of the 11th through 13th centuries, the Reconquista, the seven centuries long battle for the Iberian Peninsula between the Catholic kingdoms of Spain and the various Islamic kingdoms that ruled there, and the fall of Constantinople in 1453 to the Turks, marking the end of the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire. The Ottomans were once again on the march in the 1570s as they sought control of the Mediterranean and free reign to harass the shores of southern Europe. Against the formidable Muslim navy, Pope St. Pius V marshaled a coalition consisting of Spain, the Papal States, the Knights of Malta, Venice, and several Italian duchies. The Christian navy was placed under the control of Don Juan, or John, of Austria, the son of Holy Roman Emperor Charles V and the half-brother of Philip II of Spain. Pope Pius V was an advocate of the Rosary. He had already been encouraging its use among Catholics in response to the divisions in the Church caused by the Protestant Reformation. For the upcoming battle, which he understood to be a critical turning point in the history of Catholic Europe, he urged the entire Catholic world to pray the Rosary for the success of the Christian Armada. The 80,000 soldiers and sailors in the Christian fleet heard Mass and confessed in preparation for the battle. On October 7, 1571, the 208 galleys of the Catholics encountered the 278 galleys of the Turks near Lepanto, the Greek headquarters of the Islamic fleet. Aided by a shift in the wind that many deemed miraculous, the Christian fleet achieved a decisive victory, losing 12 ships and 8,000 men to the Turks' 240 ships and 30,000 men. Pius V in Rome, hundreds of miles away, reportedly declared the victory even as it was happening. Two weeks later, news reached Italy verifying the fact. In thanksgiving, Pius instituted the Feast of Our Lady of Victory to be observed October 7th. Pius's successor, Gregory XIII, changed the title of the feast to Our Lady of the Rosary, and the Church has observed that feast ever since. For this reason, October has been a month especially dedicated to the Rosary. And just in case you're wondering, no, 
it's not a coincidence that Scott and I are releasing this episode in October. As Kevin mentioned, the Battle of Lepanto is easily the most famous and perhaps best established example of the connection between the rosary and a military victory. But it's not the only occasion. The oldest alleged account goes back to St. Dominic and the Albigensian heresy. It's said that St. Dominic prayed the rosary for a Catholic victory in the crusade, which led to the victory at Moret by Simon de Montfort in 1213. This account, though, is considered more legendary than not, but, but nonetheless shows an early connection between the rosary and military combat. Half a century after Lepanto, fighting raged between Catholic France and the militant French Calvinists called the Huguenots. King Louis XIII called for public prayers to be offered for victory over the heretics, and in 1627, victory was attained at La Rochelle, effectively ending the Huguenot menace. It's said, because of the king's call for prayer, the rosary had been recited every Saturday for this victory. As Kevin mentioned, the victory of the Holy League at Lepanto over the Ottoman Turks gave rise to the Feast of Our Lady of Victory, which was later renamed Our Lady of the Rosary. And it was a pair of additional victories over the Ottoman Turks in Hungary, which extended this Feast of the Most Holy Rosary to the Universal Church. In 1716, Catholic forces retook Peter Warden, and in 1717, Belgrade was liberated. It said both these victories had been aided by a call to the faithful to recite the rosary for these military victories. Another example often cited is the Battle of New Orleans, waged in 1815 between the British and the Americans. The story involves an order Ursuline Sisters and Our Lady of Prompt Secour. More details of that event are available in Kevin's book, where he has a chapter dedicated to it. Not only is the rosary used to call for victory in battle, but the rosary itself is a weapon, as Kevin mentioned in our introduction. In medieval times, a gentleman would often have his sword hanging from his waist on his left side. It was easily accessible, but out of the way of the dominant right hand. As monks began to wear the rosary as part of their religious habit, they wore the rosary on their left side, hanging down from the waist. Their spiritual sword of the rosary had replaced their actual sword of steel. Today, most religious brothers and sisters who have a habit with the rosary will always have it hanging down on their left side. And they wear the rosary on their sword side because the rosary is their spiritual weapon. It is wielded by those calling upon the one who will crush the head of the serpent and who is terrible as an army set in battle array. And to this end, many popes and saints have unashamedly called the rosary a weapon. A few examples include the previously mentioned papal bull from Pope Pius V, who pointed out how the popes have turned to the rosary when they were threatened by both spiritual and temporal wars, Pope Adrian VI, who called the rosary the scourge of the devil, Pope Pius IX exclaimed, give me an army saying the rosary and I will conquer the world, Saint Jose Maria Escriva called the rosary a powerful weapon, and even Pope Francis said, Mary fights at our side through the rosary. But the most well-known contemporary example is likely St. Padre Pio. The saint claimed the rosary is the weapon against the evils of the world today. A popular account tells of one night at the San Giovanni Rotondo Monastery when Padre Pio was unable to find his rosary. He called Father Honorato and said to him, Young man, get me my weapon. Give me my weapon. Padre Pio is not asking for an AR-15 or 9mm handgun. His weapon was understood to be the rosary. An interesting connection between rosaries and war can be found in World War I. In an act that seems unthinkable today, the U.S. government actually procured and issued, upon request, rosaries for servicemen. These were durable metal rosaries, brass with blackwash and made of pull chain. Some of these World War I service rosaries, as they were called, showed up in World War II. And there was even a 1918 song titled, A Soldier's Rosary. When I was younger, I remember most rosaries looking like women's jewelry or plastic kids' toys. And they were hardly the stuff of combat, hardly something that would appeal to most men. But today, as the evils in the world become more obvious, there's a groundswell of Catholic men who feel compelled to answer their call as spiritual head and defender of their homes. And with this comes the praying of the rosary. And to this end, durable, manly rosaries, like the combat rosaries of World War I and those made of paracord, 
have become available over the past few years, and from what I've heard, are selling rather well. And when a recent article by a liberal rag called The Atlantic denounced the military history of the Rosary and incoherently attacked Catholics who respond to the spiritual warfare being waged against them, the sales of these rosaries have climbed even higher. The rosary has been endorsed and promoted by many saints and popes down through the centuries. We've already talked about a few of them. There's also St. Louis de Montfort, not to be confused with Simon de Montfort. St. Louis was a French priest who died in 1716 and is probably best known for his practice of total consecration to Mary. But it should come as no surprise that the advocate of such devotion was also a proponent of the rosary. St. Louis discussed and promoted the rosary throughout his works, but he also wrote an entire book on the subject, The Secret of the Rosary, where he recounted the history of the prayer and the many miraculous stories connected with it, explained its importance, and introduced particular methods of praying the beads, for instance by adding specific petitions for each decade. To take the first sorrowful mystery as an example, Louis offered the prayer, Grace of our Lord's agony, come down into my soul and make me truly contrite and perfectly obedient to thy will. St. Francis de Sales, who strove in the late 16th and early 17th centuries to encourage a return to Catholicism after the divisions of the Protestant Reformation, declared, I want the rosary said every day with as much love as possible. Like Louis de Montfort, he suggested additional prayers, such as greeting Mary on the first three Hail Mary beads at the beginning of the rosary. On the first, as the most dear daughter of God the Father, on the second, as the mother of God the Son, and on the third, as the well-beloved spouse of God the Holy Spirit. The seers of Fatima, Saints Jacinta and Francisco Marto, along with their cousin, servant of God Lucia dos Santos, promoted the rosary as part of the mission they received through the apparitions of Our Lady in 1917. I already mentioned the Fatima prayer at the end of each decade. Mary repeatedly urged the children to pray the rosary every day, especially for the intention of peace in the world. Then there's Blessed Bartolo Longo, a 19th century Italian who left the church with such hatred during his young adulthood that he ended up becoming a satanic priest. Through the ministry of a Dominican priest, Bartolo was brought back to the faith. In the process, he had a locution commanding him to promote devotion to the rosary. He became a Dominican tertiary, taking the name Brother Rosario. After he married a wealthy widow, Mariana de Fusco, the two dedicated their resources and energy to promotion of the rosary, forming a confraternity and also building a shrine, Our Lady of the Rosary, in Pompeii. Finally, there's Venerable Patrick Payton, the Irish-American Holy Cross Father, who was arguably the 20th century's most enthusiastic promoter of the rosary. Father Payton started the family Rosary Crusades, whose rosary rallies held in cities across the world during the 1940s and 50s attracted as many as a million people. The list of popes who have promoted the rosary would possibly include every single one since the time of Pius V. But to highlight a few, there's St. John Paul, or is that John Paul the Great? If you don't get the joke, then you need to listen to more Catholic History Trek episodes. He issued an apostolic letter in 2002, Rosarium Virginius Mariae, on the Most Holy Rosary. He wrote there, The rosary, though clearly Marian in character, is at heart a Christocentric prayer. In the sobriety of its elements, it has all the depth of the gospel message in its entirety, of which it can be said to be a compendium. For this beautiful concept of the rosary as a compendium of the gospel, John Paul cites Pope St. Paul VI, who devoted to the rosary a section of his 1974 apostolic exhortation, Marialis Cultus, on the right ordering and development of devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. He says there that the writings of his pontificate have on many occasions recommended its frequent recitation, encouraged its diffusion, explained its nature, recognized its suitability for fostering contemplative prayer, and recalled its intrinsic effectiveness for promoting Christian life and apostolic commitment. Paul uses the phrase, compendium of the entire gospel, but it's not original to him either. He cites a 1946 letter of Pope Pius XII. Back to John Paul's apostolic letter, he also refers to the affirmation of Leo XIII, who in September 1883 issued an encyclical, Supremi Apostolatus Officio, on the devotion of the rosary, in which he said, Our need of divine help is as great today as when the great Dominic introduced the use of the rosary of Mary as a balm for the wounds of his contemporaries. Not only do we earnestly exhort all Christians to give themselves to the recital of the pious devotion of the rosary publicly or privately in their own house and family, and that unceasingly, 
but we also desire that the whole of the month of October in this year should be consecrated to the Holy Queen of the Rosary. We decree and order that in the whole Catholic world during this year, the devotion of the Rosary shall be solemnly celebrated by special and splendid services. Obviously, popes have been supportive of the Rosary, but not all Christians, or even all Catholics, are fans of it. When the Protestant revolt began a few centuries ago, it retained some aspects of Catholicism, but rejected many others. Included in these were the sacraments, the mass, several of the books of the Bible, the papacy, apostolic tradition, and the rosary. The primary objection to the rosary today is often an appeal to Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, where Jesus commands that when one prays, they should not speak much like the heathens, who think they are heard because of their many words. In the Protestant King James Bible, the line denounces the vain repetitions of the heathens. Of course, it's important to remember that this condemnation is not of repetition, but vain, meaningless repetition, since repeated prayer is often praised in the Bible. Even Jesus repeated his, let this chalice pass from me prayer, several times in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father Leslie Rumble, covered in episode 57 on Catholic Australia, provides an interesting commentary on this Protestant objection of repetition. In his book, Radio Replies, he poignantly asks, if you take the principle behind your objection and push it to its full conclusion, you could say the Our Father, but once in your life. If you said it once each year, it would be repetition. How often may you say it? Once a month, once a week, once a day? If daily, what would be wrong with saying it hourly? If you've just concluded one Our Father, why may you not bring it up again at once? Does it suddenly become an evil prayer? And speaking of prayer, Kevin and I end each episode of Catholic History Trek with a prayer in Latin. And I suppose Kevin and I could end this episode with the rosary in Latin. We did briefly consider ending with the 20-minute prayer, but after careful consideration, we decided to close with one of the 150 Aves from Our Lady's Psalter. And speaking of careful consideration, feel free to carefully consider rating our podcast, subscribing to it, and leaving a review. And if you have rated or reviewed us in the past, feel free to vainly repeat this act again. I'm sure Father Rumble would be okay with your repetition. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, benedictus fructus ventris tui Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostrae. Amen. Thank you for listening to Catholic History Trek. You can reach us at catholichistorytrek.com at gmail.com.